you're better off being today a conspicuous conservative on campus. So I do not try to disguise what I am at all. In fact, I, I didn't used to. I used to be utterly neutral, and, and I try to conduct classes in a you know both sides way. But the very first thing I tell students on the first day of any class I teach is that I'm a card-carrying member of the vast right wing conspiracy. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny and Nate. Today, Stephen F. Hayward is joining us to discuss his work in writing, which ranges widely from historical analysis of American presidents to environmentalism. Stephen is a resident scholar at UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies and a fellow of the Law and Policy Program at Berkeley Law. His most recent book is M. Stanton Evans, Conservative Wit, Apostle of Freedom. Thanks for joining us, Stephen. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun to be back with the ISI gang. Absolutely. Before we get started with our interview, I'd like to thank the audience for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Stephen, you've been writing books for decades, and among them is your book, The Age of Reagan, The Fall of the Liberal Order. Could you start the episode by telling us about what liberalism's failures were during that period of time and what made Reagan a consequential figure on the world's, world stage then and uh, talk about his relevance for today? Oh, gosh, Johnny. I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, the failure of liberalism, uh, how many hours have we got, right? <laughs> but I mean, I guess you'd uh, boil it down to a couple of things. Uh, one is, is that the, the hubris and pretensions, I guess you might say, of liberalism, especially in the 1960s, where you went from the, I call it the social insurance mentality of the New Deal, which makes some sense, notwithstanding its defects, uh, to the social engineering mentality. That was the reigning, I think, core principle of the great societies. They really thought we could get to the root causes of poverty and crime and foreign policy, right? We, we could fix Vietnam by having welfare programs in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, people have forgotten this now, but when they rolled out the great society, um, people like Sergeant Shriver running the program for President Johnson came up and testified before Congress and says, we think we're going to eliminate all poverty in America in 10 years. Well, that's 50 years ago now, right? Uh, I mean, I, So that's the beginning of it and lots of chapters to follow. And Reagan was early on to two things I think that were important. One is the defects of this whole approach. He, he was criticizing great society liberalism before we even had the great society announced starting in the mid 50s. But then he also understood as a practical politician that when you're criticizing something on the left, you need to offer an alternative. So from the earliest moments of his formal political career in the mid-60s, he was talking about the creative society. So, you know, great society, the government gives you the creative society, built, of course, on markets, individual liberty, creativity, and the restraint of government power. So you can hardly set up a better alternative than that. And I do think a lot of practical politicians think only step one is necessary when I think that successful politics requires both steps. And Reagan understood that intuitively and was the master practitioner of it. Uh, Stephen, one of the interesting things about Reagan is he's long held this sort of preeminent position in the American conservative imagination. Uh, for a long time, he was sort of the the icon of movement conservatism since, since the 80s and since the Reagan revolution. Recently, he's come under, I think, some new scrutiny from some corners of the American conservative movement perhaps most notably from Chris Caldwell um, in The Age of Entitlement, where he was quite critical of Reagan for a number of things. Um, and he sort of attributed Reagan's approach to uh, American politics as the other side of the same coin from the sort of liberalizing cultural trends uh, that he was writing about from the 1960s on to now. You wrote a, a response to Caldwell uh, in Law and Liberty about uh, why you think that his analysis of Reagan was wrong. So I'd, I'd love to hear your explanation for what exactly Caldwell says that is critical of Reagan and why you think that's wrong. Yeah, so it, it's, it's a complicated scene because I think the central point of Chris's book that we have two constitutions arising out of the Civil Rights Act and civil rights mentality is absolutely right. And, and I think he states that general thesis quite well and powerfully. Uh, the irony is uh, Reagan bashing on the right has become quite popular. It's not just Chris. And the irony is, is that when my second volume of my Reagan work came out in 2009, so a while ago now, 
I attracted some criticism from Reaganauts because in my last chapter, I criticized Reagan uh, for things he didn't get done. And I suggested and probably should have written more, but the book was already long about what people learned in the Reagan years, namely, to put it in one sentence, uh, they learned that the problem of what we call the administrative state is much deeper than we thought and much harder to overturn than we thought. I think the Trump people learned from that, by the way. Uh, and uh, a lot of Reaganites criticized me for not being fully triumphant about Reagan. So I'm I'm kind of uh, enjoying a little bit of um, amusement at uh, the, the more recent critics of Reagan. Uh, and some of the criticisms have merit, but I think are understood through a distorted lens. So you know, in Chris's case, he tends to blame Reagan for a lot of the for not resisting affirmative action more fully. I actually think the, the real story is uh, it's a confusing scene because there are a lot of contradictory elements. But the whole civil rights story of the Reagan era was quite complicated. Reagan wanted to do some pretty bold things like repealing Lyndon Johnson's affirmative action executive order. And he got huge pushback from corporate America. He had corporate CEOs calling him saying, please don't do this. His own cabinet was divided. Uh, and there was a poll out that said uh, of you know, corporate executives, think about woke capitalism today, the germs of this were back then. Two thirds said that uh, even if the federal government or the, or the Supreme Court overthrew affirmative action, they'd still practice it anyway in their companies. Chris doesn't have any of that story. Uh, I don't think he knows about that story because it's really often the weeds. And I, I have to say, I don't like criticizing Chris. I like him. But you know, his bibliography has no references to any of the detailed literature of that whole period from like Herman Belts, uh, Raymond Wolters and other people who really went through that detail and told the story. So it's not as simple as Chris tells it. He has a larger critique, which um, sort of hard to summarize, but that Reagan uh, was sort of conservative on the surface, but surrendered too easily to the cultural liberalism underneath. Uh, and I actually think that's not true either. I mean, you think about the abortion fights that the Reagan administration picked. Again, some of those are in the weeds and now are forgotten. Uh, but you know, Reagan was the first president in the White House to publish a book while president. What was that? Abortion and the Conscience of the Nation, where he compared abortion and Roe versus Wade to the Dred Scott decision. Hugely controversial within the administration. You know, he had all his senior, you know, moderate aides begging him not to publish that book in an election year. Uh, and I can list other things, uh, but, you know, they're also particular and all the rest of that. And they also have receded uh, in the time. And then, of course, what was the crisis Reagan was facing in the 80s? Well, uh, you know, a collapsed economy in 1980-81. And then the Cold War, which dominated the Reagan story. I do think it's worth the thought experiment someday. Uh, what might Reagan have accomplished if, like Roosevelt, it, his first two terms, Reagan had two terms without a Cold War to fight? Hard to know, but I think he might have put more of his energy and time into reversing big government and might have had more successes than he had. But So I do think it's a little churlish to pick on Reagan to the extent that Chris does, and much as it pains me to say that. I wonder if you think some of the criticisms of Reagan that you hear, particularly from sort of young conservatives who weren't necessarily around for the Reagan era, are a conflation of Reaganism and Reagan himself. Because I think you know, I'm someone who who thinks that Reagan was, by and large, a great president, although like any president, I think he made mistakes. But what passes for Reaganism today is basically a confusion of the ends and the means, where people, a lot of conservatives take his exact policy agenda as sort of calcified law and, and conflate that with conservative principles, where, as you were getting at in your last answer, he was really applying timeless conservative principles to the specific needs of the moment, which were, you know, the Cold War, stagflation, et cetera, et cetera. And he might have reacted very differently or chosen different policies if he were in the current moment. So I wonder, you know, what do you think of the state of, quote unquote, Reaganism today? And do you think it is distinct from Reagan the man? And are the, are the criticisms conflating the two? Yeah, I, th I think there are distinctions to, to be made. I think one of the criticisms of Reagan made now is that he was too nice, right? I mean, he was, you know, this nice guy mourning in America, always quick to smile, the soft voice, although, you know, he did say some very sharp things. He had more wit that was more conventional, right? I mean, one of my favorites that really has kind of come back now in the currency uh, from the 60s was a liberal's idea of being tough on crime is giving longer suspended sentences, which, you know, boy, is that now relevant again with all our DAs who are against, uh, uh, who are against crime fighting. Uh, and I think a lot of people now uh, with the, sort of the polarization of the pre-Trump years, Obama years into Trump, uh, they think we need a harder edge to conservatism. Uh, and I think I get that. I, I think that it is true to say that in the 80s, conservatives thought the ones who toiled so long and never could believe that we could actually elect a conservative president, let alone by huge landslides, uh, 
uh, that, uh, well, we may not be winning all the policy battles we want, and we're fighting against an awful media and an, uh, an unscrupulous opposition. And that's only grown worse since then. But uh, people forget the time that you know the opposition to Reagan was pretty bitter and nasty. And that's all become uh, uh, sort of gauzy in our retrospective um, recollection of it all. Um, this business about Reagan would go have drinks with Tip O'Neill is way overstated. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think that, you know, we did think at the time that, well, we may not be winning everything, but we're, we have the winning hand. We're making progress. And slowly through, you know, the Bush one years, the Bush two years, and then Obama, I think we've, especially younger conservatives coming up, have to change their mind about that. You know, they ask quite rightly, what endures from the Reagan years? What initiative have we had? We've been playing defense for quite a while, and especially on the cultural front, losing ground. Uh, but even the economic front, you know, you have a, a large plurality, if not majority, of young people tell polls that they're sympathetic to socialism. Socialism was so dead in the 80s that Democrats ran away from it. Um, so uh, that's the change in the context that we're in. Uh, I believe, last thing I'll say, is that if Reagan were around in his prime today, he'd adapt to this very well because he was very politically skilled. I think a lot of his would-be heirs are nowhere near his depth of understanding or retail political skill. Steve, I'm curious in terms of that, uh, you had mentioned some people think, you know, we, we need a little bit of a harder edge to conservatism today. I'm curious if you think, you know, I guess what in terms of, you know, Reagan so was such a magnanimous, generous kind of witty personality. I mean, do you think it's kind of looking at the landscape right now? You know, I, I wouldn't say I, I like Glenn Youngkin. I don't know if he has the, the wit of, of Reagan, uh, but Youngkin strikes me more as someone who, you know, nice, approachable, kind of, you know, good dad vibes. Uh, and then he had a little bit of a harder edge in terms of some policies tamping down on, you know, CRT and things like that. Uh, I mean, do you think that's kind of the winning formula, like nice, nice guy, tough policies, or do you like more of a DeSantis who I also like on a policy level, but he's out there week after week, really leaning hard into kind of with a more of a assertive kind of culture war mentality than maybe Youngkin is. So what do you, where do you think we should go? Yeah, I think, uh, I think both examples are good ones and they're good to compare. Uh, I mean, it, this sounds superficial, but I think it's not. Uh, you can't underestimate the uh, the value of being comfortable wearing a sweater vest <laughs> like Youngkin did, right? You know, this is a guy who, what, he was with Goldman Sachs or something or some private equity firm. And, you know, he comes from the financial elite. And yet he looked like every man. He was very relatable. Uh, and as you say, underneath, like Reagan, underneath, he had a harder edge about policy matters. Um, so that's an ideal combination, especially in a difficult state like Virginia. Remember Ronald Reagan in 1965 contemplating running for governor of California, which Barry Goldwater lost by a million votes. I forget what, a lot. Uh, and Reagan said, look, we're outnumbered by Democrats here. I have to appeal to Democrats. Virginia's become that way. And I think Young can got that. In the case of DeSantis, I totally get and agree with his hard-edged approach because it's obvious that the media and the left have their sights on him every day, every hour of every day. And it is the smart play for him to push back vigorously on that. And uh, I think he's done that very well, shows some real strength of character. I'm very impressed with the guy. You can always improve. I I've watched him give some speeches where I thought that's a good speech, but if he worked a little harder, it'd be a great speech in its overall effect. And, you know, if he runs, we'll see. He probably will get better. So I think both examples are good. Uh, uh, but, you know, DeSantis has more latitude. Uh, because he's um, in Florida, a redder state, a uh, bigger state. I do think that uh, it's early yet, but it, it, you know, Virginia has these one-term limits for governors. But I have a hunch that if um, all other things being equal, if Youngkin were able to run for a second term here in three years, I'll bet he'd be reelected handily. It's interesting because I think both the conservative critics of Reagan on the right and the folks who see themselves as sort of partisans of his legacy – criticize some of the sort of populist nationalist elements that I think a lot of people would say DeSantis represents as a break from the conservatism that Reagan embodied. It sounds like you're saying that there are a lot of parallels as well. I'm curious, you know, you can point to any number of issues, immigration, trade, obviously DeSantis hasn't really taken a position on trade, but, you know, domestically tech, some of the more sort of aggressive anti-woke stuff. Uh, and the folks who are critical of Reagan say this is a necessary departure from Reaganism. And some of the folks who are partisans of Reagan say this is a betrayal of his legacy. Do you think both of those or, or neither of those are true? Do you think that this is actually a continuation of, of Reaganism just to meet the needs of the current moment? 
Yeah, there is some merit to those criticisms. I think maybe they're overdrawn, but I'll just give you two. One is, is Reagan was always a big high tech backer. I mean, he was, you know, he loved early Silicon Valley and in that he was following, by the way, the late economist Warren Brooks, who died 30 years ago. So you may not be familiar with him, but he was always about how the most important economic asset is the human mind. Uh, and Reagan was also pro-immigration generally, and he gets a lot of criticism for signing. He didn't write it, but signing the 1986 Immigration Reform Act. Uh, and, uh, you know, I talked to Ed Meese about this, who was his attorney general at the time. And they said, if we had it to do over again, we wouldn't have done that. What they thought was you're giving amnesty to a million people. Nowadays, we have, what, 20 million people who are here uh, or more. Uh, and then second, they thought they were really going to get employer enforcement of legal status. And that lasted about two weeks. Um, and so, the, you know, the deal wasn't lived up to on the other side and the numbers were smaller. Uh, but, but Reagan was always pro-immigration in ways that now I think raise a lot more skepticism across the board, except on the left. Uh, that's one part of it. So, uh, uh, you know, nowadays we have woke capitalism. We also, uh, in the 80s, well into the 90s, the promise of high technology was decentralizing, right? The early days of the internet said it's going to empower individuals to go around government, uh, to escape from government. And all of a sudden we wake up one day and we see the Chinese social credit system and we see Facebook and Twitter censoring conservatives mostly. And you realize, oh, wait a minute. Uh, we're back to the or Orwell's world after all. So now there are substantive and political reasons to be skeptical of the high tech community and the broader business community, which has gone, as they say, woke. Uh, uh, you know, Wall Street is now mostly on the left, amazingly enough. Uh, so I, I think that is a change in circumstances. But again, I think if Reagan were around today, he'd be pretty critical. Um, he was now and then critical of big business privately. He didn't publicly, he didn't say much about it, but I've heard lots of secondhand accounts about what's wrong with these big business leaders and why are they so weak? Stephen, we were talking uh, earlier before we uh, started the show about the appeal of Reagan in Eastern Europe. Today, when you travel there, people just keep asking you question after question. And I'm wondering if you could comment and provide some context uh, in light of Russia being back in the news. Um, could you provide some context on Russia's role on the world stage since the fall of the Soviet Union? And uh, what is it about Reagan that really resonates uh, in those Eastern European countries? Yeah. So uh, over the last, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so, I've made several trips to several Eastern European countries, more than once, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, those four, I think, mostly. Um, and what I find there are uh, younger people have heard from their parents about what it was like under the Soviet Union and under the communist rule in their countries. And they've heard from their parents about their two great heroes, Pope John Paul and President Reagan. Right. Uh, and, you know, there's a big statue to Ronald Reagan in a prominent square near the parliament in Budapest. Uh, there's Reagan monuments all over Eastern Europe and they love him there. And so the younger people coming up, um, you know, they're still finding their way along, right? You've got lots of difficulties in those countries. And they're concerned about several things. They're concerned generally about individual liberty and, and uh, um, uh, you know, democracy that's not corrupt or weak and so forth. Um, and they're, they remain worried about Russia. Uh, they all hate the Russians. I, I think for historic reasons, probably that go beyond just the communist rule of the Soviet Union. Uh, and so they love hearing the Reagan story. You know, younger conservatives today, it's such a long time ago, you know, they have more recent things on their mind. And so they're more interested in more current things. But um, uh, and then beyond all that, I find that there's a great hunger for uh, younger students, uh, especially conservative students uh, in the Eastern Bloc to learn more Oh, about the kind of things that ISI is dedicated to, right? What are the principles and structures of human liberty? Um, and all their inclinations are right. Uh, their depth of knowledge is uh, could be deeper. And that's why I like going there and spending time with them. It seems like in terms of our relationship to Russia, again, you have a split on the right where you have folks, I think, particularly the sort of neoconservative wing who, again, still laud Reagan as, uh, as one of their sort of beacons, um, are calling for really aggressive intervention in Ukraine, are calling for, are you sort of discussing Russia in Cold War terms? And then you have the maybe newer resurgent strains of the right who are more critical of an aggressive stance there. Again, you know, do you think, it's tough to obviously know what Reagan would have thought because he's not with us, uh, but do you think the, the kind of conservatism that he embodied would be in favor of a really aggressive response in Ukraine? Um, or do you think that he might have 
sort of followed the effort to recalculate America's relationship to, to world affairs uh, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, I'll do that in reverse order. I think Reagan would not be for, uh, if you mean by aggressive posture towards the Ukraine crisis, meaning actually considering or committing directly U.S. forces to the conflict, I think he'd be against that. The reason I think that is uh, one of the things that you find out about Reagan when you study him closely as president, uh, and you didn't see this publicly, but privately he was very averse to committing forces abroad. So he did, of course, order the invasion of Grenada. Uh, he did order Marines in Lebanon and then regretted that when that went so badly and cut it off quickly. Uh, but I'll give you one example. Um, so, you know, we backed the Contras, the anti-communist force against the Nicaraguan government. And that, of course, led to a big scandal as an administration. Uh, and a lot of conservatives would press Reagan in meetings with him saying, look, you know, we want to get rid of the Sandinista regime. Why don't we just send in the Marines? And Reagan would, as he often did at meetings, just stay quiet about it. And when he left, he says, I'm never doing that. Uh, I'm happy to back the Contras and give them everything we can get away. You know, the Democrats are in the way of that. I'm happy to back the Contras to do the fight, but I'm not committing American troops uh, to Nicaragua. Uh, likewise, he was uh, you know, reluctant to send troops to the Middle East or anywhere else. Now, publicly, he understood that you all, you never wanted to say that out loud the way Biden did. Uh, right. Uh, he, he always wanted to keep your enemies guessing. Uh, you know, after the Grenada invasion, Cuba was very worried. And Reagan said, good, let him be worried, even though there was zero chance he'd ever consider an invasion of Cuba. Even after his first secretary of state said, Al Haig said, well, maybe we have to go to the source of all these problems in Central America. And he got privately reprimanded by Reagan for saying that publicly. So there's that was restraint behind the surface. But understood, understanding the duty of a statesman is uh, you know, keep your enemies guessing what you might do. Make them worry about you, right? So again, his skillful level of things. I think the first part of your question, I think what's going on now um, among people on the right who are accused, I think in most cases, quite slanderously of being pro-Putin, is a couple of things. One is they, they're now so distrustful of our foreign and defense policy elites, and I think for good reasons, uh, that they're they they have their uh, you know defensive shields up very high. I, I mean, just look what Biden has said in the last couple of weeks that that sound very suspicious. You know, speaking in the future tense to troops about what you will what you will see in Ukraine when you get there. Uh, if they use uh, Russia uses chemical weapons, we'll respond in kind. And not to mention, you know, the regime change comment that they walked back immediately. Uh, I think there's good reason to be suspicious about the uh, the inclinations of our foreign policy elite. I do think some of that is overdone. Uh, it, the rough historical analogy is, is that we're kind of going through what the United States went through and, and Britain, for that matter, in the interwar years. The bitter experience of World War I led to pacifism, disarmament, uh, enthusiasms, uh, and reluctance to make foreign commitments between the wars. And that led to a disaster, because, and that's why isolationism has a bad name in America. Um, and you, you might... If you've read your history, you'll know there were huge investigations in the 20s and 30s into the munitions industry. And that was the early version of the defense uh, military industrial complex. And I think we're going through something like that on the right. Um, and a lot of the questions about that, I think, are quite legitimate. Um, and then the second part is, was it prudent to expand NATO as far east as we did? I think that's a hard to go come down on one side or the other, but a lot of people are, but if people point to, you know, Henry Kissinger, uh, George Cannon, sort of well-known people who said 25 years ago, it would be a mistake to push NATO too far East. Although what's the alternative? You could easily see Putin right now pushing into Poland or the Baltics. Uh, all those countries have been very nervous all along and desperately wanted to end the NATO. And I don't blame them for that. So it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, my own opinion is we should be arming the Ukrainians with whatever they want, including airplanes if they want them and can use them. Stephen, uh, shifting it back to uh, conservative heroes and, and figures that you've written about, uh, another figure that you describe as an unsung hero is M. Stanton Evans. He was actually a former trustee of ISI. You gave a keynote address at Philly Sock this past weekend on him. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your book and him as a figure and why you think younger conservatives should rediscover Stan Evans. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's right. He, Stan was, uh, well, I should put him in historical context for reader or listeners who don't know him. He was involved with ISI at, 
from its earliest days in the 1950s when he was a student. And of course, as you guys know, it began as the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists. It didn't become the Studies Institute we know now until what, I think 1967, Johnny, I think is one. Anyway, uh, and he was involved in its campus outreach activities and then later trustee, as you say. Uh, why stands important is that um, he was a key figure, both on the level of thought of the conservative movement and in action. He was a man of theory and practice uh, on the highest levels. And it dismayed me a bit. And he was my first mentor out of college more than 40 years ago. Uh, and I kept up with him over the years. And he was a modest man. He never bragged about his abilities and accomplishments. Uh, and you admire him for that. He, he really embodied Christian humility in a lot of ways. Uh, and he's already being forgotten, even though he only died seven years ago. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot to be learned from. For, so I think we should keep alive the memory of our heroes. ISI Books does quite a lot of that. Uh, and I think there's still a lot to be learned from his example, uh, his counterintuitive ways of thinking, uh, his methods of institution building, and above all, his uh, uh, his training of journalists and what makes for quality journalism. Uh, his biggest argument about journalism was not necessarily or primarily that it leaned to the left, although he often criticized that, is that it was so mediocre and and that reporters, they, they have a group think mentality. Uh, and they don't go after the facts enough. They don't consider alternative hypotheses. And so we want to train a generation of journalists to simply work harder and think harder. Uh, and I think he was pretty successful at that. So Stephen, I just read Revolt on Campus for an essay I wrote for, for Claremont Review of Books on, on academic freedom and conservatives sort of changing disposition towards that idea. Uh, and it was a fantastic book, very engaging um, as everything that Evans wrote was. But I, I have to say, I found, you know, as a retrospective, as someone who just graduated um, from a very left-wing college campus, the scene that he was describing might have been slightly overly optimistic because the entire reference to revolt on campus was this uprising of conservative students who were revolting against the sort of oppressive uh, left-wing orthodoxy on campus. Of course, maybe maybe there was one, and, and maybe, you know, I think institutions like ISI certainly have stood the test of time. But the left-wing orthodoxy was not really effectively revolted against. It's gotten much more stifling since the time that he was writing. Um, so I'm curious, you know, looking back on the phenomenon that he was describing, do you agree that it was maybe a, a slightly uh, hubristic reading of what was happening? Or do you think there was something to it? Well, I don't think hubristic. I think you're right that he got the story wrong. But let's remember that book came out, I think, in 1961 or 62. It was his first book. And what that really grew out of was the founding of Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, ISI was already around doing its work on campus, and Young Americans for Freedom wanted to be more political, uh, more so than being intellectual, as ISI has always been. And part of what that was is that, uh, you know, the Goldwater enthusiasm began really in the late 50s and especially in 1960 among youth. You know, the people cheering for Goldwater at the 1960 Republican convention were all the younger people. A lot of them not even delegates. They just came to the convention hall and wanted to cheer for him. Uh, and I think uh, it was plausible to think that with establishment liberalism kind of becoming stale, and of course it soon got overthrown by the new left a few years later, there was good reason to think that this uh, this nucleus of people behind Goldwater were going to end up being a larger voice on campus. Uh, so, I, you know, he, nobody saw the new left coming quite the way it did. But on the other hand, uh, in a certain other respect, I think he might have been right. And for there, I, I'm trying to remember who the left wing thinker was. It might have been Todd Gitlin who died recently. I think he's the person who said, uh, the right stormed Washington and the left stormed the English department. <laughs> and boy, is that ever true. I mean, the English department is the, you know, maybe the worst of the humanities, leaving aside all the gender studies and critical theory disciplines that aren't really disciplined, right? Uh, they're just terrible. And so who wins that politically? Well, you know, we still think we're not winning, and in a lot of ways we're not. On the other hand, there's something true about that. And so a lot of the uh, the energies of the, the we might call the young wing of the conservative movement did go into practical politics. And they became the foot soldiers for the Reagan elections and the Reagan administration. And a lot of them still around today, retired. Uh, but so I think there's it's a mixed balance sheet there. I am curious on the question specifically of conservatism and academic freedom, because this is sort of prominent in my mind right now. Uh, it is interesting to, to have read you know, two of the books that sort of were responsible for launching the conservative movement, God and Man at Yale by Buckley, uh, Revolt on Campus by M. Stanton Evans, both written by young men who had recently spent time on college campuses, and both quite critical, surprisingly, of the concept of academic freedom. I think there's some differences between what Buckley and Stanton and or and Evans were saying. Buckley, 
thought the entire concept was bogus. Evans was sort of slightly more sympathetic to the idea, but he was criticizing the liberal use of it to basically mask what he said was a very unfree um, campus. But in general, they were both much more critical than I think you, the way that you hear conservatives talk about academic freedom today. What do you make of that shift? Do you think conservatives have forgotten their roots on how they thought about academic freedom? Or do you think this is sort of a necessary and rational response to the, the increasing sort of uh, sen- censoriousness of, of the modern campus? Yeah, I think I'll, uh, I'll again, I'll work backwards and change the way you ended that to a desperate response <laughs> to what's happened. Uh, yeah, look, no, I, I think uh, yeah, there, it, it is one of the more remarkable um, uh, place switchings that you can observe in the last 50 years or so. Now, attacks on academic freedom tend to come more from the left, from the dogmatic and tyrannical left on campus and elsewhere, openly calling for junking the First Amendment and so forth. Uh, whereas uh, the, the premise of people like Buckley, especially, but other people, Harry Jaff, who I've written about was, wait a minute, the idea of free expression, academic freedom, however, you, whichever aspect of that you want to grab hold of, is that it was metaphysical in its roots, right? Uh, the rights of conscience, um, but also connects to the objective moral order of the universe, right? There's an objective ground, moral ground for the idea of free expression. However, you can mark out rational limits to that. That was the argument uh, that Buckley was making about, uh, uh, you know, in defense of uh, uh, of uh, universities that wanted to have loyalty oaths or to fire communists from their faculty, is that these are people who are using academic freedom who, if they got power, would end academic freedom and free speech. We're seeing that now. And he thought uh, that any, a free society has the right to defend itself against people who would use our own tools against us. That's an entirely coherent point of view that I think has been forgotten. And so now what you get is we're all for you know, free speech and the First Amendment and academic freedom without ever making that older metaphysical case of why. And that's why I think it's been a mistake. Uh, but I, I think uh, to restate the, the first thing, it's now sort of the last life preserver for the dwindling num- number of conservatives in academia. And, you know, without the slim read of, you might say, the old ACLU free speech position, we'd be doomed. It does seem, though, and this is more, I think, from God and Man at Yale than from uh, Revolt on Campus. I found Buckley's prescribed solutions relatively unsatisfactory, where he was saying that we should outsource decisions about curriculum to the trustees, which to me is not no way to run a university. Um, I mean, he was something like 24 when he wrote the book, so you can forgive some of the youthful sort of philosophical errors. Uh, But one thing that he did say, and this is something you were getting at, Stephen, that was quite prophetic, was that the embrace of liberal academic freedom by many sections of the right actually helped lead to our undoing because we gave in to the paradigm that it is forbidden to a forbid, essentially, and that uh, you know communists, radicals, et cetera, have a right to be protected absolutely on college campuses because the principle of academic freedom compels it. So in many ways, do you think that the predicament that the right finds itself on on many college campuses today is at least partially an outgrowth of its capitulation on the principle of academic freedom in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I think I agree wholeheartedly with everything you just said. And I think the strategy now of leading with uh, with only the, as I put it, the life preserver of the First Amendment and free expression, that's just a strategy to lose more slowly. Uh, and and uh, I don't know. I you know I run into a lot of a lot of conservative friends who don't see it this way. They say, well, you know, we, we that, that we, we should just be free speech absolutist now. And yeah, I think this is uh, this is doomed to fail. Um, I can't really add it the way you put it. You put it very well just then, Nate. Hmm. Steve, I'm curious on you know you're on a radical campus at Berkeley. Um, I'm curious. Well, a sort of what what it's like there, especially um, you know post 2020, if things have changed a lot in the last couple of years in terms of the climate, but also in terms of the strategy that you take on campus. Because I, you know, I from w- in one sense I could see it making you know be, being totally rational for you to go and just argue for more of an absolute academic freedom position, and if you were successful, Berkeley might get significantly better than where it's at right now. But at the same time, you know, I wonder, do you think you'd be more persuasive if you just actually argued for, you know, ordering Berkeley towards the good? You know, I mean, <laughs> how would that be? How would that be received? Well, so well, so first of all, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long and complicated story, but two or three highlights or bullet points. One is, I think Berkeley 
And a lot of public universities are not as bad as private liberal arts colleges. I think a lot of places like Oberlin, Kenya, and you just go down the list, are actually much worse ideologically, uh, much more tyrannical. Um, now, Berkeley has got a lot of crazy people, but it's got a lot of non-crazy people, and it's got a lot of people in the middle, and it's a big place. And so I, you know, I did write in Commentary Magazine of being run out of the public policy school by a mob of woke graduate students uh, who couldn't bear my presence, but the law school, which leans left and has a very liberal dean, uh, they said, oh, come back here. You know, we, we want to have someone like you around. Uh, and the political science department I get along with very well. It's very highly rated. It's got some closet conservatives and semi-uncloseted conservatives. A lot of people in the middle who are perfectly sensible, moderate liberals that I get on with very well. Uh, and it's a great big place. So I like to joke that the borders are porous and it's big and the mask mandate helped because I was easier to disguise <laughs> when I snuck on the campus. Uh, uh, the other thing I'd say is... Um, this campus, I think most, really did go into shock after Trump's election. You know, one of Stan Evans' great jokes was is young conservatives had to get over the Goldwater defeat without grief counselors. And it's literally true that on the Berkeley campus, and I heard this elsewhere, the day after the election were large scenes of students, graduate students, and some faculty hugging each other and crying about Trump's election. So that, that old joke of Stan's turns out to be exactly right. And, and things start hardening then. And then, of course, things harden further after the George Floyd incident from two years ago now. Uh, and it moved much further. I, the campuses have galloped even further to the left in these last two years. Now, COVID complicates it. Uh, you know, the mass mandates are over here at Berkeley. Uh, not everywhere, I hear, but they are here. But student life is nowhere near back to normal. Uh, you don't have the student tables on Sproul Plaza. The student clubs are still dormant. We still have a stupid regulation this is important, actually, that says we can't have any food at you know, meetings or in classrooms. And the secret to student events uh, is pizza, <laughs> right? You've got a pizza. Or say, and if you can't have food, it's, it really is hard to get students out. That's always an attraction that gets your marginal student that you want to reach, right? So it's very, very frustrating. Uh, and so we'll see where this all goes. I thought things would calm down. Well, it's still early yet, but uh, things really haven't calmed down. Uh, you see the hardening of the diversity, equity, and inclusion ideology, even here at Berkeley, where it used to be on the relative scale more reasonable than a place like Oberlin. Uh, but it seems to be galloping out of control, too. So we'll see how long I last. Uh, I think the, the strange constellation of forces that brought me here six years ago now wouldn't be possible today. Uh, but I'm here now and uh, uh, proceeding carefully, I'll put it that way. Comparing the student radicalism now to the 1960s, one of the things that the really interesting things that I've heard from some conservative professors who are around during the 1960s, we were talking off camera about my professor, Tim Fuller, who's a conservative on a very left-wing college campus, is actually that, interestingly enough, the sort of new left activists were much more interested in going after the sort of old school, moderate New Deal liberals than they were in going after the actual doctrinaire conservative professors. So, you know, people like Professor Fuller actually got by, I think, relatively easily because they were so sort of far away from what, what these guys sort of saw as uh, the, the squishes in the middle that they were, they, they were sort of a lost cause already. I, I'm curious if you think that that's true today where the moderate liberal professors are actually the ones who are under far more profess far more pressure from the sort of activist types than the conservatives who are sort of an entity unto themselves, if, if they exist at all on campus, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're, you're onto something important there. Uh, two or three threads. One is, as Harvey Mansfield has said, and he advised me a long time ago now, you're better off being today a conspicuous conservative on campus. So I do not try to disguise what I am at all. In fact, I, I didn't used to. I used to be utterly neutral, and, and I try to conduct classes in a you know both sides way. But the very first thing I tell students on the first day of any class I teach is that um, I'm a card-carrying member of the vast right-wing conspiracy. And I tell some jokes and show some pictures of me and Reagan and George Will and whatnot. Uh, and, and by the way, a lot of progressive students I meet, they're very smart students here, they kind of like that. And they actually want to hear something different. I've had some of the better ones tell me that. I've heard them tell stories that, oh, other students I know on the left say, we wouldn't think of taking a class from this guy because he's a right winger. But that's not everybody. Uh, and the second thing is, you're quite right about the, the new left of the 60s. I think, it was, I think it was Tom Hayden who said the object of the new left was to murder a f liberalism in its official robes. And I've talked to a few of the old, uh, new, now old, new lefties from the time. They said, we didn't care about conservatives or Nixon or Reagan and Goldwater. 
we thought they'd make the revolution come sooner. I mean, they really were Leninists and kind of crazy that way. Uh, but finally, uh, one of the things I get to do is I get invited a lot to homecoming weekend events for alumni. A lot of them are from the 60s, and they all say two things. A lot of them are still liberal. Others have moved to the right, as often happens. But but they all say the same thing. When we were students, we really were for free speech. We really meant it. What's wrong with these students today? They're all coddled. We wanted to grow up. I mean, it's true. If you read the Port Huron statement, they didn't want administrators coddling them. They attacked administrators for coddling them and saying, we want to grow up. We want responsibility. We want to, we want to take charge of our lives now. And now, you know, we have crying rooms and safe spaces. And so the old, the new lefties who are still around are appalled at this even if they may agree politically with the general views of students today. And that's a small hopeful sign. Maybe, I don't know. Um, it, it is a pretty stark contrast though, from you know, the student days of the sixties and beyond. Does the administration, you know, with the alumni coming back kind of saying, you know, what happened to free speech? Does the administration try to do a balancing act or do they more just side with what, whatever the students want? Yeah, no, I have to praise the administration here, especially Carol Chris, the current chancellor, who's been chancellor for five years now, I think. She's an old-fashioned liberal English professor, but she's serious about free speech, and she became chancellor after the Milo Yiannopoulos disaster of, what, February 2017, so was it five years back? And she wanted to break the fever, and she went all out to make sure that Ben Shapiro could speak the following fall here on campus spent $600,000 on additional security and because she wanted to break the fever and tell the left, no, you do not control this campus and this person is going to speak. She's been spectacularly good on this issue, I think. Uh, and that trickles down to other departments. And so, you know, for all the, <laughs> the famous reputation of Berkeley, this is considerably a better place than a lot of other places around the country. It is interesting reading the Port Huron statement now. Of course, it's it's not a conservative document, but there are strains of sort of criticisms of uh, administrative bureaucracy and the sort of soullessness of the bureaucratization of, of uh, American life, as well as some of the free speech strains that I think are, you know, compared to some of the the stuff that you hear from the new new left now, I think is um uh, it's it's interesting and worth worth taking seriously. Um, but Stephen, we're we're near the end of our time, but I wanted to ask you the question that we ask all of our guests, which is, in your estimation, uh, what is conservatism? Yeah, so <laughs> there's the famous Richard Weaver definition. You guys know that one, right? <laughs> About the paradigm of essences and all that. I have a slightly simpler one, although it's still complicated. Uh, my philosophical definition, and that doesn't get everything, but the philosophical definition is that conservatism, conservatism philosophically is the search for the unchanging ground of changing experience. Right. So, you know, we're always changing our technology and our social customs, but there are certain unchanging things, the most important of which is human nature, which is now under direct attack, as we all can see. Right. Uh, so that's the biggest political issue of our time is what is human nature? And you don't have to be a biologist to figure that out. I'll just add that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. Um, if people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? Yeah, so I write every day on powerlineblog.com. That's all one word, Powerline Blog. It, it's kind of an antiquated name, but Powerline's not available. It turns out to be a seller of electronic supplies. Uh, and it's, you know, 20 years old this year, and I write there every day. And we have a big readership and have a lot of fun there. But that's where I post up uh, commentary on things almost every day. And then I write the same places that you do, Claremont Review Books and a few other spots. Great. Thanks again, Stephen. And thank you all for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.